Welcome to The Pestle, reviewing and breaking down movies to look for insights into the movie making process. Hosted by Red Rob. All work and no podcast makes Jack a dull boy. Let's kill the light and start the show. Welcome, everybody, to The Pestle. Today's show is brought to you by the Magic Hour Chronicle. Get the big scoop from the littlest people only in the Magic Hour Chronicle. Welcome, everybody, to The Pestle. I am Wes. And I am Todd. And this is a podcast made by filmmakers uh, for everybody so that we can kind of break down, analyze films. You know, we sometimes what we learn in this, you know, goes into production. Like I'm constantly trying to find ways to uh, get better, even at the silly things. Um, but there are a lot of odd aspects of filmmaking that I don't feel like we normally get to touch on in, in, in the show um, because sometimes you, you have to be aware of presentation um, and, and things that might be uncomfortable to a viewer. We do a lot of commercial uh, style work that's meant for uh, consumers, right? Consumer content. Um, and when you're doing that, you really have to think about it from the, the viewer's perspective um, as well as your own goal and intention with creating a piece of content. Um, for instance, uh, if you're doing a, a, a commercial documentary, someone might have a, a strange eye um, or maybe just really bad teeth. Um, and then in every kind of scenario, you, you sometimes, especially casting for film or commercials, you have to start asking, um, does their weight affect the rightness for the role? And that doesn't mean overweight. It means any kind of weight. Uh, are they you know, too thin to be like, king badass um or whatever right are they too pretty for a role um that happens uh and so you there's just always these weird little things you don't necessarily think about until you're in this industry um i had a project one of my earliest projects i had to i was hired to do a, a documentary for a dog park um they wanted to uh, build a really cool dog park uh, so that owners could come have their dogs off the leash and have all these nice amenities. And so they hired me to, to, you know, kind of make their pitch video, if you will. And the woman who was uh, running it uh, had uh, an eye issue. Like she had almost lost her eye and uh, gone through surgeries and just, you know, by some miracle was able to save her eye. Uh, but while it was still healing, uh, it was very, you know, distractive. Um, to the viewer. And so I'm getting ready. And again, this is one of my earliest projects. Uh, I'm, I'm prepping for the shoot. I have about, you know, a week, week and a half where I'm location scouting, trying to find the right spots because the dog park doesn't exist yet. And so you're having to fake some things and I'm going into this. Uh, I'm like, we're going to have to have a potentially awkward conversation um, because it's something that I need to ask how she feels about. And if there's uh, a type of way that she wants to address it. And I have to come up with my own ideas in case, um, you know, she, she doesn't know, um, or, you know, doesn't have an opinion. Uh, and so you're bracing yourself for a really tricky conversation. Uh, cause on the one hand, you don't want to make someone feel bad because, you know, that's just her life that there's nothing wrong with her. Uh, but at the same time, she's trying to accomplish something with this video and that could be a deterrent <laughs> or distraction to the viewer who's trying to learn about what she's trying to do. And so there's a lot of things to balance out in that. Uh, luckily in this scenario, she'd already thought about it and she showed up just wearing sunglasses. <laughs> like it doesn't have to be a complex fix. Uh, and it was perfect. Everything was fine. Uh, I think we made a great video. She was able to get some funding out of it, um, and you know, progress her plans. And so it went really well. Um, but you're constantly thinking, I, we, this past week was shooting with a bunch of kids. I was shooting elementary students and junior high students, um, which is so much fun to, to work with those kids. And they bring so much energy and uh, strange weirdness to the set, right? Because they can't stop being kids. And in some ways, directing kids is the easiest thing in the world to do, uh, depending on the, the scenario. And in this scenario, it couldn't have been easier. Um, but I'm curious, like, do you run into situations that are like, we're gonna have to finesse this. We don't... and I don't know how or uh, just constantly thinking about how does X, Y, Z impact the viewer? Yeah, uh, all the time. Uh, I love that story, by the way. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem was solved. But you didn't have to do anything. Nothing. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we've talked about it on the on the podcast. Um, there, you know, there's almost there's a there's a stage in almost every every um, 
project that a problem happens or uh, you know you have to you have to figure out how to make something happen that you weren't planning for originally um in uh, a recent project that i was working on turned out at the end almost end of the project the client didn't like our intro and and wanted us to do an animated version and like all of a sudden and it was it was like okay well it, you know in that scenario you have to actually like like because the client is paying you a lot of money uh and they want what they want and they want it for a specific reason and she had a good reason for wanting it um and and so you know it was my job to see okay can we make that happen one with our budget two with our staffing three mm-hmm. you know like like what is it going to look like for the the viewer are they going to you know is it is it going to help the message right and so we found a way to do it in which in which did help the message but yeah that kind of stuff happens all the time i mean i think um or or it's happened where a i've i've been working on a job and the client has someone that they want in the video and that person is either not um Usually, like with us, it doesn't matter how they how they look. You know, right. when, when I'm working on a bunch of IT stuff, it's like it's it's not like oh, you're not right for the role. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. But um, it is if they if they don't speak well, uh, if it's either hard to understand them, um, and they because the client has to say whether they they usually don't want subtitles or they haven't in the past. And I think subtitles are getting more and more popular these days. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but at the time they weren't wanting subtitles it's like okay well if you know if they speak very broken english then i can understand them but not everybody can and that's a deterrent or if they're just very hard to interview and that's usually the biggest thing where it, like you know you, you ask somebody a question and they give you two words or you know um <laughs> or they give you the answer but it's it's in in a way that like you can't even cut it together in post mm-hmm. And so you have to, you know, have those hard conversations, you know, beforehand with them and, and it usually turns out okay and they, they understand because they're hiring you for a reason, right? They're hiring you to identify those problems, you know, so that when they get the video back, it's not like, oh, darn it, you know, I should have worn sunglasses that day, you know, or something, or we should have brought somebody else on, you know, whatever that answer might be. But no, that's yeah. so good because, yeah, I mean, if you run into a situation where you have like uh, Brad Pitt from Snatch just kind of mumbling through, and you're mm-hmm. just like, y- yeah, okay, <laughs> and you don't know what's happening. Um, yeah. But there are those other people who just don't interview very well. Uh, and one of the things I do when I'm preparing, you know, these interview documentary style um, projects where you're interviewing someone and post, you're dicing up their uh, their interview to to tell you a thing. And I know you do the same thing um, is that I will script out not necessarily what I want them to say, but the the stories that I want to tell, because if I have like a two minute video, I might be able to tell anywhere from uh, three to seven vignettes within that. Uh, and if I know, OK, here's my five stories that I could potentially tell. Maybe they don't all sound good at the end of the day, but you want to prepare as many as possible, but not also. I mean, it's a fine line. You don't want, you know, 50 of these uh, because of my second reason, which is I go in prepared to and I, I prepare the the, the subject um, when I'm when I'm running it. And like there's times when I'm just a hired gun and I just show up and shut the hell up. Um, but whenever it's my set, I, I just tell the the subject, Hey, you know, I'm probably going to ask you the same thing a thousand times. So, uh, that's not nothing to do with you. That's everything to do with me. And, uh, I might be just trying different things on video. I might be trying different things on audio. Um, and don't feel like you can't say the same thing you said last time. Uh, but if it comes out a different way, that's okay too. Um, and just trying to, as much as possible, pull all the stress off of them because the, what I notice with everyone who's not, you know, an actor, uh, in on camera talent is that their first 15 minutes are garbage. You're, you're basically going to throw all that away. Um, and so what that does allow me to do though, is run through my set of questions one time, have them stutter all over the place because They've been thinking about this maybe for the past couple of days and they're anxious um, and they're going to just ramble and uh, miss their talking points 
uh stutter uh not make a coherent sentence <laughs> like it's just gonna yeah. be bad uh but yes. then once you get through all those beats that they knew were coming like usually it's the client themselves that are in the video and they they tell me what they want the video to be about and so i'm building this based around their talking points uh, but once they've kind of been through it all one time they think they're done and they relax and from there, I can start asking those same questions again. Maybe I'll rephrase it a different way. Uh, I usually have some phrases in my head that I'm looking for or some parallel of. And once I hear those bites, I can kind of move on. Um, but after that, then I can run through it another two times. If things are going really smooth and fast, I might do it three. Um, but just having that now, suddenly when I get in post, uh, this is where, you know, being a really good editor pays off because you can, I splice all those answers together in a way that, you know, you would just, uh, the, the unassuming filmmaker, um, wouldn't know like a normal viewer wouldn't understand that I just spliced, you know, three completely different, you know, questions into mm -hmm. a single answer. Um, yeah. because I love using cutaways to not just clean up the audio, but also, uh, expound on an answer or, uh, even remove redundancy and make it more pointed. Um, sometimes yeah. one sentence is better than three, you know? Uh, yeah. So those are all yeah. our tricks of the trade that you and I both do. And it's, uh, it pays dividends. <laughs> yeah. I, I found, I find that, um, doing things like, like giving them the questions beforehand, mm -hmm. but then not asking those questions. Like asking a question, but in a totally different way or in, in between questions, asking a question that they are not ready for, um, even if it has not, nothing to do with the, the topic, huh. because then they, or making a joke or laughing yeah. because then they know, oh, this is being recorded, but this guy is joking, you know, like, okay, cool. So then I can say really whatever in, in, in whatever way. You know, because obviously he's not going to include that joke in the edit. So it's like a subconscious thing huh. where they, they just feel that they can let down their guard because I don't care who you are, even if you're seasoned, you know, and a seasoned actor, when a camera is on you, you're different. Always. I, I mean, you and I are different. You, we hit record yeah. on this very show. and We've done this 160 times. Our guard goes up. The, the things we say change just because we're trying to make sure no one misunderstands us or we don't say a stupid thing. And there's still times when we do, uh, because at the end of the yeah. day, we're also talking to each other and, yeah. and there's a certain <laughs> level of guard that's already down. But I yeah. completely agree. No matter who you are, uh, a wall yeah. goes up when a camera starts rolling. Yeah. You just become slightly different. And even if it's just, you know, a one single uh, like a, if it's just like an error about you, you know, that can change. And then, and you know, what you say or how you say it might change too. So like how I talk to my wife, uh, when, when, or you, when this is off, it's completely different. Well, it's, it's not even completely, it's just a little different. Yeah. It's just, you know, I'm not worried. Like, you know me, I'm not worried about, like you said, somebody taking what I said wrong or in, in a way that I didn't intend it or, or, you know, just look like an idiot, which I guess I kind <laughs> of do anyway. Do. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what we do. Um, uh, but yeah, so like trying to make sure that whomever it is that you're interviewing uh, understands that like, look, you could say the stupidest thing. It's not going in the video. Don't worry about it. Wow. Just speak words. And then, you know, if I, if I feel like I don't have it, I will let you know, yeah. you know, it's a bit like I'm doing my job. So you just, just speak to me. That's it. And usually after, like you said, after about 15 minutes, they kind of like, you know, calm down, you know, but if, if I'm just going straight script, you know, and they've had the script, then they're feel like they're, they need to like answer in a scripted way. It's so, too canned. Yeah. Totally, totally too canned. And so, and, and I've been on, uh, in interviews where I have not given them the questions and that's even worse. That's like, because they're come they're coming at it where, they have they don't know what to expect, right? And so they're just trying to come up with the answer on the fly. That almost never works. I, you know, and I was told by um, people that I worked with when I first started where I work, and and they're like, well, you know, sometimes it's better not, you know, not to send them the questions. It's always better to send them questions. I've never been in an interview where them not having the questions was better. Like it's ridiculous, right? Unless you're doing like an E entertainment tonight kind of like right. thing where you want to catch them off guard because you want that, you know, 
that kind of like feel whatever, but that's not what we do. No, no. Especially because I know, you know, your clients go in with a laundry list of items they want to cover. Uh, and so yeah. if, if you walked in and you didn't have them prepared at least a little, uh, that would be ugly really quick. It would be ugly. <laughs> yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I love the overall point is that, you know, at the end of the day, we're just trying to build trust um, with who we're talking to in order to get them to relax. Um, because building yeah. trust is really important in all kinds of ways. Um, 100%. Yeah. So what are we covering today? Today, uh, we're moving along with this Halloween theme. Um, we're covering Let the Right One In. Uh, so if you haven't watched this, please pause pause this and go watch it because uh, there'll be spoilers all over the place. I believe it's on Hulu. Is that right? Yes. On Hulu? Yep. Yeah. For sure, uh, we'll we'll be covering a lot. Uh, we'll touch on cinema, uh, some of the cinematography. Uh, yeah, hiding adults in the frame. Uh, they do some interesting things with that, uh, as well as some of the story and writing. There's some classic vampire rules, and they do it in a fresh way, uh, as well as uh, the way they use failure to propel the story and other such stuff and things and stuff. Okay, and I'm going to butcher every one of these names. The I'm just letting nightmare. the entire audience. This is my biggest nightmare. When letters I'm terrible start at this already. having additional like signifiers around them, artwork on yes. top of them. You, like, yes. <laughs> artwork, yes. <laughs> All right, uh, synopsis of the film. Oscar, an overlooked and bullied boy, finds love and revenge through Ely, a beautiful but peculiar girl. Directed by Thomas Alfredson. That's the only one I'm going to get right. <laughs> Written by John Avid Lindquist. Cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytema. Starring Kare, <laughs> Kare Hedenbrandt as Oscar. Lena Lenderson as Ely. And Patrick Rydmark as Connie. Perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah. since pronouncing the names alone are difficult. Uh, yeah no one would understand all the words that come out of their mouths without subtitles. And so uh, right. no sound bite this week, folks. Um, but this movie is interesting and has a special place in my heart because this was the film that made me, I feel like if this movie didn't exist, I don't know if we'd be as good of friends as we are. Like you're my best friend. And I think the spark of it happened. We were, or, uh, is that demand media is before, you know, yeah. one of their buyouts. Yeah. Um, but we were hanging one out one day, uh, by, and I, I mentioned the movie or maybe you mentioned it and you're like, yeah, uh, I saw this movie, you know, uh, let the right one in. I was like, holy crap. Todd likes movies <laughs> like game on. <laughs> and it was awesome. Yeah. And so this movie was kind of a, a, a red flare that kind of went up over the horizon. That's like, Oh, Todd's down. <laughs> and so, oh, awesome, man. And so I know we loved this, you know, back then. I'm curious. I have probably a litany of questions uh, that I'll pepper you with, but uh, just starting out, uh, does it hold up? Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. It's probably, <laughs> I, I can, I can probably tell you now it's going to be my favorite of all the, all the Halloween movies that we, Ooh, that we cover. Nice. It's so good. Every, everything about it is amazing. The directing, the cinematography, the acting, these kids are incredible. Um, the idea, the premise, um, uh, the the twists that you don't see coming, um, the ending is just heartbreakingly beautiful and scary <laughs> and yeah. and like uh, the whole the whole thing throughout everything is just wonderful and it feels real it feels like something that could really happen you know in real life and so they and they they get away with not showing too much um uh you know crazy stuff that she does right like you know the, you'll hear a whoosh, and then all of a sudden she's at her room uh, you know on, on the outside of the building or something um uh, the one thing is like her climbing up the building in the background at, at the going to see her 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 guy or whatever after he burned himself or something anyway just and it's just so beautiful yeah. it's so beautiful and i'm so glad it's not in english it would have ruined it had it been in english i think yeah the remake it was fine but there's something the performances in this movie just are hard to top like as far as child performances in this you know uh 12 year old age range 
incredibly hard. I feel like you got to go back to stand by me in order to start competing mm -hmm. with these performances. Um, and they're amazing, but there is something, and I don't remember the English remake too, too well. Um, but there's something so uncomfortable, uh, that this movie does where, uh, you're, just, they're constantly like in their underwear and it just adds this creepy factor to it. I don't know, you know, if that impacts you as a yeah. parent, like uh, it maybe totally. it's not that big of a deal to you, but for me, I'm just like, Oh God, this is so <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it is uncomfortable having, whether I'm a parent or not, it's uncomfortable <laughs> to watch a, a kid in their underwear on screen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're not alone in that. Don't worry. Uh, no, yeah, you're, you're right. And, and it, I, I am uncomfortable the whole time. And the fact that it's, it's in the winter, you know, the middle of the winter, it's all, it's uncomfortable as well. It's visually uncomfortable Every you know everybody's like you know everybody's very cold all the time. Um, I I felt like the sound was amazing. All the sounds of the, the it's very hard audio wise to make snow sound manageable. If you think mm. about it, like having you know any movement you hear a, any movement at all, and so you have to be very cautious of that. But also they did it really right. If someone had been outside, like when when um, uh, Oscar was outside and he would come inside, you know, he would still you know, have snot coming down his nose. He would still be breathing heavy because now you're breathing different temperature air. You know, when you're outside, the air is thinner because it's cold. And so you're breathing heavier. And then when you come in and you're having to walk through snow. So then when you come inside, you're still, you're breathing heavy. They kept that going. They didn't have too much music over anything, which was perfect because in real life, you don't have a soundtrack <laughs> most of the time. Um, it was just, uh, amazingly, I felt like I was a fly on the wall in this whole, this whole thing. And they also did this really cool thing where they, you know, you knew Oscar had a mother, you knew he had a father and they played a role in the film. Um, but just enough to be a role, not enough to be something that was like hugely support, supportive as a character, right? So it was a supportive as a role. So we got to inter introduce to his dad but then found out, okay, well, his dad's a drunk and, you know, they're, that they're, his parents are divorced, you know, that, um, you know, his mom is there, but she also has to work. And so she's away a lot and, and he has to walk to and from school. And, you know, those, those, there's always enough of a, of a, of a, of a character build to, to expand on Oscar's world, hmm. but not so much that like we miss them if they're not in the shot or, you know, you know, we ask, where are they? You know, it was, it was just enough. It was like wonderful. Um, and then the, the way they developed, um, Ely's handler, uh, how, whatever you want to call him. Uh, I mean, that guy was amazing as well. Like just because what kind of a role is that? That's, that's really hard to describe to an actor, like <laughs> what to do. You know, you, you love her. But you also, and you don't fear her, but you also like respect her and know that she is, you know, the, I, I don't know. It's, it's just very, do very you fun. think that, cause she calls her, calls him Papa at one point. Do you think that's her actual dad or do you think, uh, that's just a role that they were playing? Um, and no, it's just a role and that he's like, he is what Oscar is going to be, right? Like yes. she brought some other kid along and he aged up and now. Um, she's on to the next because when he dies, she is completely indifferent to it, right? She, yeah, she like has a snack and then he falls out the window <laughs> and just slams into the concrete yeah. and she just kind of lets the blood drip a little bit and you know, just kind of distance uh, in her eye and looks onto it and then leaves like it's completely it goes to Oscar, goes to Oscar, completely unemotional, yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean. Yeah, I think she's been through a lot of them. Hmm. Honestly, you know, she's uh, yeah. She said she's been twelve for a long time. I don't think that means just this guy's life. You know, I think yeah. it means you know a uh, a dozen of those guys. Honestly, and yeah, Oscar's Oscar's the next. Yeah, the going back to the uh, the performances, like Oscar is so. 
I love it. I mean, all of the performances are in- incredible, um, but I think the three main kids are just absolutely mind bending. Like Oscar never like forces a moment. He stays in this very odd childlike headspace, right? Like he's in the pool. Um, and when the cool kid's trying to like engage and talk to him, he's still being himself. He's just being a little weirdo with like his mouth open into the water and he's like spitting water around and he was just like, bro, can you just act cool for 20 seconds? And, like, yeah. <laughs> start to fit in. Be cool. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and then there's also this awesome moment whenever he hits Connie in the head with that pole. Oh yeah. And splits his ear open. Like the look on his face where they like were shooting up into his face. And um, there's this crazy look of like satisfaction that comes over him. Um, and it's just epic. Uh, I that w- that's one of those moments where I'm sure the director was just like crying and um, in video village while he's watching this. He's just like, oh, my God, we're getting this. This is so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also Connie himself is like perfectly evil every time he's on camera um he is just nailing it um whenever like he he flicks his nose or whatever uh he doesn't overdo it right he just kind of takes this silent satisfaction grins to his buddy and just walks away uh and he's just constantly just amazing every he embodies like the bully and then of course we at one point i think we get to see his brother kind of rough him up a little bit um and you know, he goes along with yeah. it. It's like that's part of his life. And you get a glimpse into his childhood as well, um, especially at the end when his brother like starts trying to what kill a, him. And what a yeah, what a great addition having his brother come in to like develop Connie a little bit. Yeah. Right. To give you that that knowledge of, oh, he's grown up with this. This is Yeah. This is like you said, who he is at what he's experienced. It's just great. And it adds so much to that final scene too, right? Where we're, we just watched Connie get killed. And up until that scene, we probably would have been okay with it. But now seeing a little bit of these dynamics, he doesn't actually want to kill uh, Oscar. Um, but now he's caught up. And, you know, as far as Ely's concerned, eh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. You're all done. Except for the kid in the bleachers. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. She yeah. she let him be. I guess he he actually was like, I'm ejecting. I, I don't want to be a part. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. And But then Ely herself uh, just carries a weight to her right uh which contrasts against oscar perfectly right oscar's this light and not really even in control of his body right his weightlifting is awkward he has no mm-hmm. motor control um he's fidgety uh but she is in perfect control of herself even when she wants to eat oscar whenever he opens up his hand right she maintains self-control um in a, in a situation that could have just ended his life uh which adds to her like you said, being very, very old, uh, much older than the the man probably who uh, was her her caretaker, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, another question uh, for you is: Do you think and this is a really hard uh, uh, thing to to wrestle with? Every film wrestles with this question, which is: Did going into this? I knew she was a vampire. I knew this was a vampire story. I didn't know how it was going to unfold, um, but there was no surprise there for me. Um, and I wonder one, I guess if you knew um, and two, if, if it really matters one way or another, uh, because I think the, the, the conundrum that every film gets themselves into is how do we get people into the seats um, while still retaining some surprises for them? And I don't think this is the easiest movie in the world to sell because it's a vampire movie on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a slow burn and almost nothing happens for two hours. Uh, And so I can imagine trying to sell this to the same crowd who goes and sees Blade and Blade 2. And they're going to be very pissed off. That's not this crowd. Uh, And so selling this is really hard because no matter what you do, you're screwed. If you sell it as a vampire flick... uh, disappointment um but if you don't you know try to pitch that element uh then you know no one's gonna see it (laughs) so uh, you kind of just have to i guess lean into the the mystery of what is this girl in some way and i didn't watch the trailer beforehand so i don't know remember what Mm -hmm. they did but 
I don't know. What's your thoughts on all that, you know, garbage I just said? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's no, no, no. I think it's actually a brilliant question because uh, especially the way that trailers are, you know, trailers, they very bombastic a lot of times and they try to hit you over the head and so many times they give away too much. Um, it just ruins the, the damn movie and it makes me pissed. Uh, in this regard, I think you're completely right can't really give away the fact that she's a vampire. I I didn't I didn't know the first time I saw it that she was. Um I think I maybe I assumed or something. I can't remember, but I it was a it was like a surprise to me. Um if you want to know what I would do for the trailer, yeah. I would okay. Um and you could have shown this as a clip. Uh mm -hmm. is just for a minute straight show the shot of him hoisting that guy in the in the in the the woods, hoisting him up oh. and cutting and cutting his throat or That's like doing whatever he did to drain the blood. That's it. No no cutaways. No uh um, you know boom or like you yeah. know got a narrator or anything like that. Just That's the trailer. Let the right one in. That's it. I That's mean, good. God. I like it. I like it. Imagine, imagine if that came out as a trailer. Not only would it like, would it you know make you pay attention, uh, because it's not not like something that you're used to seeing, but it would make you ask like, what the heck did I just see? Kind of like, I mean, look at the Matrix. Mm. You know, the Matrix trailer, uh, which I haven't watched in a very long time. They did it right. They don't give you anything. So when you go into a movie, when you go to watch the Matrix, and you've never heard of it, you don't know what it is everything is new. Everything is, I've never seen this before, or I have no idea what's happening. And you're learning along with everybody else in the theater, but every, you know, about what everybody already knows on the screen. It's so cool. It's so cool. And yeah, I think that so many movies lack that now, you know, you kind of, yeah, you do have that conundrum of, I need to get butts in the seats, but I mean, maybe a lot of ways is just to not give away things, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to giving away 90% of what the damn movie's about, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. one of those things that I, back, you know, forever ago now, J.J. Abrams used to be the best at. Like, he would just kind mm -hmm. of pitch a mystery to you. Um, and because his name was on it, we we would sign up. We were like, yeah, I'm, what, is, what is this railroad track that's exploding or whatever? Uh, and you just signed up for the mystery. I think somewhere along the way, he's kind of lost a bit of my trust. But uh, I think if he were to do that again, I would probably fall for it again, to be quite yeah, honest. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Ask the question yeah. and don't give the answer. That's that's, that's pretty it. good. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, good point. Good question. I think, I mean, for me, I, I agree with everything you said. Like, uh, I don't know if this will end up being my favorite Halloween, of uh, batch of the Halloween films we do, uh, but it's high contender man it's the the performances alone kind of justify it um mm -hmm. and one of the things i was surprised by uh putting together together the uh, show notes was it was shot by you know hoyt van hoytema uh who does a lot of nolan's films now um he started wow. uh, with interstellar um and i think he's been with them you know since then which has been i think dunkirk and uh tenet but and i i mean it's it's it serves its purpose. It's both uh, beautiful and unassuming, right? It's kind of flat, uh, which yeah. fits in perfectly into this kind of 70s era aesthetic. Um, but it works for me so well. The pacing, I love this kind of slow horror uh, and the way it just slowly, almost like a, a pinwheel, just kind of slowly uh, keeps building more and more arcs outside of where we started because we kind of just began with him and her. Um, and then we just see all these kind of dominoes get knocked around and impacting one another. Um, she kills the wrong guy because she couldn't get her blood. And then, um, that guy's friends kind of go on alert and, um, she attacks, you know, another one of the group. And, uh, we kind of see how that impacts her, um, and their confusion over what's happening with their friends and in their community. And it just keeps expanding until they, uh, just leave. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you can imagine this is what happens every time they go anywhere. Um, yeah, exactly. Just exactly. mistake after mistake and dead body pile up and we got to go. Um, it's gorgeous uh, in all the ways that, you know, we don't get a lot of these days. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it asks the question of how would a vampire actually survive? 
if a vampire existed, how would they actually survive? I mean, because, I mean, there's 8 billion people on the planet, you know, I mean, like, and you can't go out in the day. So you have to have someone protect you and you have to have someone, you know, do things that you couldn't, that you can't do, right? So, but then you also have to, you also have to leave when it gets suspicious and yeah, and then cover your tracks and yeah. Any, anyway, I, I absolutely adore it. Every I've seen it, I think four times now, and every time I watch it, I just I find another little piece to love and another little reason to be scared of it. And you know, the scariest movies to me, I hate movies that have jump scares; mm. they drive me insane. And the scariest movies to me don't even—I mean, they might have one or two of them, but they don't rely on it. They yeah. rely on the suspense and on the 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 questions that you ask yourself as a viewer um, during the movie. Of like, is there someone around that corner? I think there's someone around that corner. Oh my god! Oh my god! Watch out for the corner, you know. And nothing happens. That. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, that does it because I. That's that's the scary that I want. I don't want you jumping out of nowhere just to like get a rise out of me. That stuff. It's cheap and it it's it's not what it's not my favorite. Completely agree because here what heightens all that stuff is the emotional buy-in with Oscar. Um, yeah. We're seeing him get bullied and. Uh, seeing him basically do nothing about it and it's through mm -hmm. her she gives him some of her strength um, she teaches him how to fend for himself um, and in that way she makes him a better uh, person or at least a stronger person um, that his parents weren't doing his uh, dad was an absentee and just periodically there uh, but same thing about his mom his mom was only kind of there here and there yeah you know um, and to that effect, I mean, that was one of the interesting things about this, uh, where they're hiding adults in the frame, so to speak, uh, because when kids are around adults in this film, uh, they sometimes minimize the adult involvement through the cinematography. Uh, and they do this to help emphasize that kids are in their own world with their own rules and their own problems, right? Because the thing with being bullied as a kid is you're constantly around adults, but either adults aren't aware or they're not intervening. And to the kid, you know, it doesn't really matter which one you still got to figure out how you're going to handle this. Um, because bullies don't just stop on their own. Uh, yeah. I, I have no problems with Connie getting smacked and having his ear split open. I would probably have my kid do the same thing. And honestly, if my kid was a bully, I'd want the same thing to happen to him. These are just mm -hmm. things that, uh, you should not get away with in life. And, uh, that's how you get your reckoning. Now, I would not want them to end up dead, you know, decapitated in a pool. <laughs> that's, right. That's, that's, that's not, where I draw the line. Ending. <laughs> Decapitation. Decapitation. <laughs> draw the line. Lose an ear. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. We can all go mm -hmm. without an ear here and there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but awesome. they, they do it great. Like in the opening scene in the classroom, uh, the teachers that are out the front, the teacher and the cop, are just out of focus like they're technically in the frame but they're not sharp instead oscar's in focus and then once he starts ch chirping up uh connie turns around and then the bully becomes in focus um and so they're establishing this whole idea um that kids are kids and adults are living in two separate worlds two separate spaces um and they do another thing and this is my favorite one in the film uh which is after the bullies slash his face right with the branch they they kind of pin him down and start hitting him in the leg and they're not getting anything out of out of him with that and then they they whip him on the face which is a great edit right there because they kill all the ambient audio and just leave this ringing noise as you see the cut start to slowly um uh, open um it's just a beautiful little moment that they you know created and you just feel terrible just witnessing this on screen you feel terrible um but then he goes home and his mom is asking what happened and of course he lies um and what I love about the scene is we never see her face in this scene. We see Oscars. Mm -hmm. She's detached and not really involved in his life. Um, and the thing is, I wish they kept that rule in play for the entire film. Um, yeah. It really isolates him and reinforces his relationship with Ely. Um, and this is the one thing that I would say the Matt Reeves remake nailed. Um, let me in because they kept this up throughout the 
the entire film, even I think when he's with his dad or whatever, um, they just nailed that visual element and it succeeds, um, for sure. And so they still were tinkering around the edges in other ways, but I think this is kind of the strongest, uh, visual insertion that you could have made is to just never let us see the parents. Um, they're just, they're kind of around, but they're not there. Um, and then fast forward, I think to the hospital, uh, there's this, great little moment right when you mentioned when the nurse goes out to find her right she sees that this kid didn't wear shoes and their feet are dripping wet from the snow and she must be like freezing that poor kid uh, and so she goes outside and we find uh Ely's silhouette on the building right um and what i love is they probably could have hid that a little bit more uh if they had pulled focus to the nurse instead of to Ely on the, on the side of the hospital, but they didn't. Um, and instead, uh, we're just, we're, once again, we're, we're not in that world. Those people do not get to connect with, with our heroes or our main characters. Um, and of course, right after that, she feasts on dad or, uh, her, her caretaker. Um, but overall cinematography wise, uh, it's bright, overly lit daytime scenes. Um, against these dark heart, you know, harsh contrasty scenes at night. Um, and it's stark, like the sequences from day to night, uh, are really stark in tones. It heightens the horror of daytime drama. I think it just adds this, uh, kind of severe normality to it. Um, these terrible things are happening, right? He's being bullied in broad daylight. Um, and no one's doing anything. Um, it just feels all a little too real. And of course, dark contrasty night scenes are always going to play well in, in horror. Um, the, uh, one of the things I loved was that first attack under the bridge, um, because it's almost pitch black underneath the bridge, which lets us create a lot of tension and, um, hide some of the effects of her like biting into them or whatever. Uh, but what the reason it works, of course, is there's a nice background, the white snow that they made sure they had a lot of light blasting onto. It creates a contrast that allows the the silhouette to form in the first place as this guy's walking underneath the bridge. You need that contrast. And uh, it's very simple. And they use snow to like maximum advantage um, in, in every way. Right. Whether it's that scene or just the blood scene, whenever he's being hung upside down from the tree. Now you have this white dog wandering into this deep, dark red blood lapping it up. It's just, you feel it. You feel all the horror. You feel all the, the grotesqueness of it all. Um, and it's just fabulous. <laughs> um, and just as almost a side note here, I love the seventies era. It works so well. There's so much style and colors. There's a lot of these weird textures, especially in the houses, you know, they have this weird wallpaper in the bathrooms and, uh, mm. shag carpets. And it's just all like, you feel like if you didn't know in 2021, you would think this movie was actually shot in the seventies. Um, it, it's just all a little too perfect. Um, and then aesthetically as well, I love the effects that they used on her, um, her nails, her, on her, on her hands are just these raw fleshy red, uh, where, whereas her feet are just rough and dirty. And, um, it's like, she's never been inside a shoe in her entire life. Um, which at this point is basically the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but as far as story and writing classic vampire rules this is one of the more surprising things because right around this era we we're starting to move around move away from classic vampire stuff um and into well, like the twilight like we're gonna make vampires different and special again um and here they went away from that almost like if you made a zombie movie today and they were just they only ate brains and they moved at, you know, half a mile an hour, um, kind of thing. Uh, that's not really how vampire movies work anymore or uh, zombie movies work anymore. And so, but here they went back to the classics. It's so good. Uh, and I think the thing that I love about it is they slowly reveal like the rules through visual demonstrations that are rooted in the story. It's not just exposition. He doesn't just say, uh, Hey, what's your deal? She's like, well, uh, rule number one, I need blood rule number two. I can't eat anything else, right? Like instead of just kind of having it laid out, uh, they give a story beats throughout the entirety of the film. Um, it never really stops. Uh, and 
I know this sounds so obvious, but y'all don't understand how hard this is to do. It's really hard to build your story around uh, expanding your universe and the rules that we're, we're operating under. Um, but they absolutely nailed it. Uh, and so, for, for instance, she can only eat blood, right? She throws up the tiny chocolate piece uh, that he gives her or whatever that little thing was. Um, we see her and she's like, maybe I can just try it. And, you know, it does not work out in her favor. Um, she has mm -hmm. bloodlust, clearly. Uh, Oscar cuts his hand and uh, he's doing it to make a pact with her. Um, and she kind of freaks out a little bit. Um, she doesn't attack him, but we do feel the tension of him exposing himself in this really naive way because we see how she's reacting. And then we're like, oh, oh, she has bloodlust. Um, and that's a classic kind of vampire uh, thing. Cats hate vampires. That's a people may not even remember that one. Um, that's been a very classic, very classic, old school classic, um, mm -hmm. probably like uh, Christopher Lee type classic, you know, vampire stuff. Um, but yeah, they, they keep it going here. Cats hate them. That's one of the scenes. The, the first time we see the cat hiss is just incredible. Uh, the cat attack later on um, is, has both hit and miss. Like some of it's kind of cool. And then some of it's a, I don't think she, she should have flung the cats off uh, or at least not in that way. Uh, it kind of cheapened it. But what, what I loved about that is that I still went with it. Like uh, I love this movie so much. And I was so into the story that I was very willing to forgive any kind of blips. So I was just like, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Let's go. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. you just, you just work with it. Um, another rule, they can turn others into vampires right? Demonstrated mm -hmm. when she doesn't finish a kill, uh, which shows the consequences of letting people live, uh, which could, if you were having a conversation about it, they don't touch on this in the film, but it might ask the question is killing people of kindness um, instead of letting them live uh, because she clearly was not the, the woman that survived clearly was not happy with, uh, with all that. Um, yeah. But it also maybe shows why she had someone else getting blood for her, for her, um, because to have her going around trying to kill people and missing sometimes uh, could create a bigger danger for her. Um, mm -hmm. if, if, if the word starts to get out, oh, vampires are real, then suddenly uh, she's a lot easier to spot in that kind of situation. And so you can kind of mentally build out the world in that way if you want. Um, mm -hmm. But sunlight kills them right the infected women woman uh demonstrates the danger of just being exposed to sun um and of course they don't grow old like you said i'm 12 i've been 12 a really long time um of course we see she's an older woman through that uh uh little moment she has with oscar where she's like you know imagine what it's like to be me for a little while and uh that might be another power she has there's uh some of these more nebulous powers that vampires have uh but of course that little moment also reinforces why she keeps saying that she's not a girl it's because she's a fully grown woman um mm -hmm. and early on uh you can create a lot of confusion around that which is fun for the viewer right because what does she mean by that does that mean does she mean she's a boy and then you're like no it means that she's not a human um and then of course at a certain nauseating point, you realize, no, she's a girl. Um, but then you mm -hmm. also uh, had this moment of saying, oh, wow, she's really old. Um, therefore, not a girl. Um, of course, vampires are very strong, right? She snaps the guy's neck. I, I remember reading recently uh, under one of these weird Ask Reddit threads uh, that in order to break someone's neck, which I grant you is a disturbing image, but you have to be able to lift like twice their body weight or something like that um breaking someone's neck is not an easy feat um uh, really yeah, yeah it's something crazy oh. uh like that um i don't noted know. noted for the I, my next time yeah i right. <laughs> i don't think i'm gonna google that <laughs> to, but, yeah yeah <laughs> i'll just go with it uh but anyway she's really strong all right uh she can climb buildings and trees so she's very light so maybe she doesn't fly um, which is, you know, sometimes invoked with vampires, but she, she's very swift and light on her feet. I love that intro of her um, when she just kind of suddenly appears standing there. Yeah. And when she jumps down, she almost floats down. Floats um, down. Yeah. That's freaking perfect, man. It's so tiny <laughs> and subtle. Subtle. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, um, and obviously she's immune to the cold uh, because she's not 
fully alive and that's kind of one of those nebulous things too because oscar asked her are you dead do i look like i'm dead um and so Mm -hmm. it's this thing right that's yeah she's she she's maybe not dead but that's why they're called undead uh the undead because they're not technically dead but not really alive in that way either um and of course the uh the best rule of all of them you must be invited in is reinforced throughout the film but what i love that they did of course that no one i've never seen a vampire movie answer the question that we never really thought the answer is what happens if they enter anyway and we get an answer to that because he oscar makes her walk in without an invitation and he boy does he regret that one (laughs) yeah if i could get that one back ely i i promise Mm -hmm. um but then last the last one i picked up on maybe there's others um is that vampires usually have familiars Um, sometimes it's an animal but often they have human familiars and a familiar is just kind of this short term uh thing to to say they have someone that is kind of like a pet that's devoted to them um and in this case it was her papa um and probably now it's oscar um yeah and so a lot of classic vampire rules going on in there uh one of the things writing wise that i love that they did um was that first failed kill by the the familiar that i'll call him now um is he right he uses the knockout gas uh which is a crazy little sequence in itself where he's pretending to hide it and the guy's like what's that and he kind of shows it to him then he just grabs him and manhandles him um strings him up and then he has to run away right the the dog and the people on a, a dog walk find him stumble onto him and it's kind of cool to see what happens when they fail like yeah he, w- he was there to get blood for her and we see um him almost do it right uh and it's great there's so many payoffs with this little sequence because we've now already murdered someone and so there's this visceral payoff that's still there just because he failed uh it almost doesn't matter like we got the visceral experience of seeing him succeed um as well as the crazy uh way that he's going about collecting blood for her it's just like gut-wrenching um but it also sets up an expectation for the viewer uh which if you walked in and you didn't know this is a vampire movie you see them collecting blood, which is a telltale sign for vampires, right? They, they need blood. Um, and of course, now we know he's in on it, uh, but we don't assume that he is the vampire or else he just would have got to snacking. Um, vampires aren't necessarily good at the the uh, the marshmallow test, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Delayed grat- gratification. That's right. It's not a thing. <laughs> and so uh, in one scene, we've laid out a lot of stakes. He's a killer, he needs blood, and he failed. Um, and then the follow-up scene solidifies those stakes with the blood is for Ely and he's now in trouble. Like he's beholden to her and she's like giving him hell about it. Um, and of course it creates a desperation and more bad outcomes because now she takes matters into her own hands and must kill again. Um, which leads to the rest of the story as it begins unfolding, um, one bout bad outcome after another. Um, and it's perfect. Uh, there is a random bit that is uh not great uh this is one of the the effects the effects are largely really really good like the the scene whenever she goes in uninvited and starts bleeding out freaking awesome like they nailed that um but then we move into the scene right after that and that bothers me so much because the the blood still looks the same and it's certainly, you know, five, 10 minutes later or something. There's time has passed. Um, even if it's only a couple minutes, the the way they cut it together, it makes it feel like this takes place, you know, at least a 20 minutes after, but it should start to Brown. And that bugs the hell out of me. Like the way blood mm. acts when it's exposed to oxygen, um, it starts to dry out and, you know, get flaky and it, uh, the red becomes this rusty, dark, uh, you know, color. Uh, and instead of doing that, uh, it starts to just kind of look like Halloween makeup on her face, um, mm. which sucks because for a movie where they really pulled all the stops, I mean, you have people scaling buildings, um, like they're Spider-Man, uh, like, 
taking the extra hour and a half to to get her makeup right there, I think really would have paid off a, a hell of a lot in terms of um, buy in and in, into the world. Um, I believe that that's a nitpick, yeah. right? But the my I think my bigger problem is that almost all movies get that wrong, and it's just it drives me nuts. Um, there is one film that makes a big point of it, and I've always appreciated that movie for that reason. Um, but if you what know, is it? you know, oh, okay, well, uh, what's it? It's Ryan Johnson's, uh, the brothers bloom. Um, oh. it's, it's a fantastic movie. I highly recommend it. Um, but my last little note, and this is more of just a, uh, a side note is, do you know what they, they Morse code at the very end when she's in the box on the train? No, I don't, but I want to know now. So apparently he taps out, um, uh, and just bear with me for 10 seconds, uh, P-U-S-S, uh, which, you know, sa- says puss, but in their language, it means small kiss. Aw. It's really, it's really endearing. <laughs> Isn't what it? does she tap back? Yeah, uh, I think she Same? tapped it, yeah. Aw. It's just adorable. <laughs> Aw. And how do we, in a terrifying way? You're right. Oh my God, she's carrying this on. Yep. Forever. Wow. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. Little. I was just curious. I was like, I'm not. I'm not going to go and learn Morse code, which sounds like something I would do and something I've thought about. It doing. is a hundred percent what <laughs> something that you would do. If I had just a tiny bit more energy in me, I probably would. But yeah. Um, that's i think the part that gets me is starting to differentiate like the taps from the dots if it wasn't for how just irritatingly hard that is to do by by ear i would do it but uh, yeah yeah i just i don't see that happening no i give it a couple of years and then... <laughs> oh you'll do it so yeah i mean that's pretty much all i got have i not recommended this this is amazing i am so excited right now for what i'm going to recommend later um yeah uh, awesome. Me too. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't. Awesome. That actually might be it for me. I don't. I don't. Cool. I thought I might have had one more question, but uh, I think I asked them all. Um, nice. Yeah. So, so what would you give it? I think. Oof. I might put it at like I don't know a nine out of ten, and I can't tell you what that extra. I mean that's high we don't hand out a lot of those nines um Mm -hmm. and in my normal rating this would be a four and a half uh but yeah i it's it's ineffable i don't know what that last piece is if it's just uh even though i think it's shot perfectly uh i think part of me still wants a little bit more beauty in my cinematography (laughs) Um, yeah yeah but the performances alone make it just achingly good uh yeah what about you I was going to say eight and a half, um, uh, but I am, I'm leaning towards a nine. I'm going to say 8.7. <laughs> it, it's, it's really, it, I mean, I can't, I'm like you, I can't really say what I would want more of, um, uh, because it felt very real worldy hmm. and I'm not a big vampire person. I just feel like there's, I don't know. It was like, I don't know. Vampires are strange to me because they have so many limitations and yet like, like debilitating limitations, you know, like not being able to go out during the day means you literally can't touch the light. Like, so half of the, half of the day is gone, done. You can't do anything. It's a major limitation to me. So like vampires in general just feel, um, but then at the same time they have like super strength and they can, and they're, they can, you know, they're very, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so it's, it's weird, but it felt very real worldy, which is what I loved about it. Uh, I still love, and yes, the acting and cinematography and the directing, it, it just unbelievable. So uh, I might be talking myself into a nine. No, 8.7. I'm going I'm to hold fast. I think, and it, there is something interesting about that dichotomy of the sun being the ultimate giver of life on our planet. Um, and them having long lives, um, yet incapable of interacting with the thing that's ultimately giving them life. Um, Mm. there's something kind of strange and, um, not usually heavily explored. Um, it's every once in a while it's kind of touched on 
if for no other reason it's a rule that usually you need to acknowledge and demonstrate in some kind of way um mm -hmm. but it's yeah it's a fascinating thing um for yeah most vampire movies also are really shitty they're sure. they're really like campy and uh you know like the vampires are these big I, you know it doesn't I don't know. I just don't resonate with it. Um, stuff like this, though, I absolutely do. Where, especially making it a kid, just brilliant. Making it a kid so that you you can identify with it. it it's hard. It's harder to identify with a grown with a gr a grown vampire, right? Yeah. But with a kid, you know, your first gut instinct is to trust that thing, and no matter what that is, and no matter what that thing is. So, so that I thought that was a brilliant move. And, uh, um, it just fan, I mean, like, and I guess it had to be a kid, right? Cause then <laughs> like a, a grown vampire wooing a kid is a little, <laughs> little harder right. right, to get that to come across on screen. Right. That's just creepy. That's just creepy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was, it, I, it was very interesting story told in a beautiful way and, uh, acted, you know. It can't. The acting couldn't get any better. There yeah. wasn't a moment where I felt like taken out of it. You know, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. perfect. So, what are you going to recommend this week? Well, I mean, I can't. I I can't believe that I haven't recommended this either. Um, because it's like kind of a. I mean, I guess I don't really recommend like scary movies very often. But you know, we're going into going into Halloween. So, um, one of the first ones that kind of like caught me off guard in ways, but that I identified with, you know, because of when it came out, where I was in my life, where it came out, um, uh, is Scream. I mean, nice. just, you know, when you when you have Drew Barrymore, well, I'm not going to say, I don't want to give anything away to those who have not seen Scream. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of twists and turns, things you don't expect. Um, it is scary. There are a ton of jump scares in it. It's just... The thing I said I hate, yeah, that's full. This movie is full of that shit. Um, uh, I mean, that's very annoying, but it kind of goes with it because it's a little bit campy. It's like this high school kind of thing. And so you kind of, I don't know, I, you kind of expect it. Hmm. So yeah, I'll recommend Scream. Nice. I'm going to recommend this uh, a movie called Spring. It's another kind of romance horror uh, film. Uh, it's a really unique take on that genre, if that's even really a, a genre, like romantic horror isn't, I wouldn't say there's a lot of uh, films in that library, um, but this is really one of my favorite little films. It's a small budget movie. It's made by these two guys that I think are just brilliant. Um, Justin Moorhead and Aaron Benson, and I might be tangling their names together, um, but I think they're just geniuses. Uh, they made some other films since then that I, I find really entertaining. Uh, they haven't quite got back to the level of spring yet. If you've seen, um, you, you might've seen their work. The Endless is another one of their films, um, as well as uh, Synchronic uh, with Anthony Mackie. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's on streaming on whatchamacallit, uh, Netflix right now. Um, same guys, um, but they made a movie called Spring. It takes place somewhere in Italy. Um, it's charming um, and it's just perfect. Like I saw this movie and I was just, and I actually, well, it's interesting because I, I reached out to them on Twitter after watching this. And I was like, guys, I just saw your movie and I'm just so inspired right now. Um, and they were at Sundance at the time. They tweeted me back. It's like, mm. man, we know how you feel. Uh, we just watched out, walked out of a showing of The Witch. And I cannot tell you how excited I am for you to, you know, check this movie out. Um, and so from then on, I wow. was just waiting for The Witch to come out, which uh, which I did. Um, which? which? Which I did, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and it surpassed my expectations as well. But um, yeah, so go check out Spring. I'll put a, a, a link in to the trailer in the in the show notes but i think it's better if you just sit and watch it it's one of those where kind of like let the right one in if you can get the opportunity to just sit down and watch it without any for foreknowledge uh i think it's a better payoff um and you go in you know expecting a, a little indie film um and I, I think you'll have a really good time yeah so cool stay tuned for next week we're going to cover Zack snyder's dawn of the dead uh, I think it came out in what, like 2004. And uh, I, I checked our, our 
view counts on YouTube the other day randomly, which I, I don't usually pay attention to how much we do uh, just because we don't do a lot of numbers. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we recently broke 20,000 downloads, which is pretty cool. Um, but I was looking through our, our most viewed YouTube videos, uh, which doesn't have all of our, our episodes up. Uh, but the, the most viewed one is uh, the what is it? The zombie one we did World War Z. World War Z. Yeah, yeah. that's got like over 3,500 views, I think, um, which is, you know, decent for us. Uh, awesome. And so I'm like, oh, well, I'm glad I lined up another zombie film because another one that did well is 28 Days Later. Um, yep. that, that did really well as well. It's got, uh, I don't know, a couple thousand or something. Um, and so cool. That's awesome. I, I used to hate like zombies, zombies, but I, I actually like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're fun um because those well because of those two movies in particular yeah those really brought it to life no yeah. pun intended um yeah. and so yeah we'll cover that next week <laughs> sorry that's <laughs> good if you're enjoying the show don't forget subscribe drop us a review on itunes um also leave us a note if there's something you want us to talk about or cover if there's a film we haven't done yet and you're like what are you guys gonna get to this movie um let us know because we probably will cover it as long as it's not some movie that like three people have seen um, in the far reaches of Scandinavia, um, <laughs> which if even if Mary June, uh, if you if you want us to cover, you know, we'll we'll do we'll do that uh, just for you. Um, <laughs> Junie Marie. Um, and so <laughs> also want to give a quick shout out to Joe House. I keep forgetting to do this uh, on the air anyway, um, for hooking us up. If you haven't listened to the Blade Runner 2049 episode, uh, that was such a good episode, uh, but it would not have happened without Joe. So thank you for hooking us up with uh, uh, Chris and Cassie. They were absolutely fantastic to have on. Um, anyway, and if you want to leave us a note on this episode, you can do that at the pestlepodcast.com slash let the right one in. And our quote of the day is from Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Deep into that darkness, peering, I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. Oh, it's creepy just reading it. Yeah. <laughs> it's Halloween season. <laughs> makes, you, makes you want to go, go read that. Did you know that it, it, UT in their... Um, UT is actually very famous in in their the museums that they have because at one point the president of the um, of the the college um, uh, spent almost all their money on just getting getting stuff for their uh, for their museum. It was like back uh, in the seventies. Yes, back in the seventies, like millions, millions, just accruing you know things for their museum, and they have an actual manuscript of the Raven. What? There, you can go look at it. I've actually seen it with my eyes. Yeah, Edgar Allan Poe's that. Raven, handwritten by him, the man himself. I did go see yeah. it whenever I was doing uh, some work with your wife and uh, yeah. other staff members at the Department of English at UT. Uh, we went and toured around. We were hoping to shoot in there. We never got to film in there, though. Um, uh, but they also have the Gutenberg Bible in there. And, yes. Uh, that's like... I'm telling you, man, oh. if you ever get a chance, like if you're in Austin, it, you can go by. I mean, they will, and you can just ask to see whatever and they will take it out. I mean, you might not be able to touch it. It mm -hmm. might be under glass, but you can look at it. It can be, you know, right there. They've got some, you, you'll be there and you'll think, why the hell is this here at UT in Austin? How, why, why is this not in the Smithsonian or in Florence, you know, in some next to the david it's it's unbelievable but yeah. uh but yeah it's harry ransom yeah. center that's such harry a Ran that's what it is thank you i yeah. forgot the name <laughs> yeah awesome great way to end it great way to end it anyway thank you guys so much for staying with us this long we really appreciate it make sure to join us next week we're doing Zack snyder's dawn of the dead and share anything that you'd like us to review we'll take a look at it see if we can review it um until next time i am todd i am wes go watch the movies Oh, lost my headphones.